Hello everybody, this is Mr. McKeever here and welcome to the last one of our weekend video series of the year when we talk about the fall, the Soviet Union, and the Cold War kind of just being done. Alright, so how this is going to work is that we've, we've already introduced this guy in class, but the guy's name is Nikita Khrushchev, and when he comes into power, uh, Stalin is going to be removed from Soviet Russia, and we actually call this period de-Stalinization. Because of what he did to the Russian people, they are going to look to take the busts or pictures of Stalin away. They're going to try to move on from that life. And the Institute of Soviet Union is going to be a little bit more, you know, I guess we'll say equitable to the people. And what we have is a leader in Nikita Khrushchev who's going to be a politician. His goal is to run the Soviet Union as best as possible while not also ending all life on Earth, which is probably a good thing. Well, he's going to face a lot of challenges early on in his run. In the 1950s, we're going to see a Hungarian revolution led by a guy named Imre Nagy, who's not going to try to get rid of communism. In fact, he actually is a communist and pretty adamant about it. What he wants to do, though, is end Soviet influence in his country. Have Hungary become a, a really just truly independent communist nation in Eastern Europe, not really bullied around by the Soviet Union anymore. While that doesn't really work, because it blows up in his face, and what ends up happening is they're going to destroy the entire government of Hungary instead, and put in a pro-Soviet government, and they're going to have Nagy executed. But what this does is China shows a little cracks. It's a novel effort, uh, but what we end up having is having a series that where Khrushchev is going to start to look weak. I mean, we've already talked about Cuba and the issues with that, uh, and between the Hungarian incident and the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev is kind of going to be pushed to the side. They're going to view him as not strong enough to really wage this war against the United States and maintain the prestige of the Soviet Union. So he's too weak, and they get rid of him. So, in looking for a new Soviet premier, the Soviet Union is going to look for someone who's going to be very strong, both militarily, and someone who kind of reminds him a little bit of those old Stalinist ways, which is really weird considering they had just gone on this huge rampage of getting rid of Stalin, but apparently that's what the Russians wanted anyways. So, they're going to institute a new leader named Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev is going to be, you know not Khrushchev. He is not a politician at heart. Uh, he is known as the, the Soviet hammer. And he's going to really kind of reinstill control of the Politburo, the Communist Party, over the members of the Warsaw Pact, particularly in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. So this is first going to be seen in Czechoslovakia when a guy named Alexander Dubček doesn't exactly want to kick out Soviet influence. What he wants to do is revive society in Czechoslovakia. And we've talked about this numerous times. Prague itself is actually a gorgeous city and it's one of the hubs of culture in all of Europe. So when this thing called the Prague Spring begins, when society and culture become reborn in the city, uh, Brezhnev institutes what he calls his Brezhnev Doctrine. And that is if anyone attempts to undermine Soviet influence, they will be met with the harshest of military force. And you can see from this picture, it's kind of exactly what he does. These people are not like soldiers picking up guns or anything. You have a tank and then random people running away from a tank. So again, we have a little bit of unrest in the Soviet Union, whereas Khrushchev, you know, for the most part, is viewed as weak. Brezhnev is not. He kind of overwhelmingly stomps down any rebellions that take place. But then the Soviet Union begins to change and really the Cold War itself. Uh, this desire to constantly be at the threat of nuclear war is not really something that either side wants to maintain anymore, and we're going to introduce something called detente. Detente is an extraordinarily crucial topic in the Cold War, and it's a lessening of the tensions that you know really drove the last 30 years of the Cold War. From the you know late 1940s up really until about 1970 or so, we have a lot of animosity that breaks out between these nations. And once we finally get to the point where we're no longer constantly trying to blow each other up, we're really seeing who's going to be that first person to do it, we see new facets of the Cold War break out. Instead of having an arms race, we have a space race. Uh, we see who's the first person to go to the moon. We see a lot of different changes. Hey, the, the Soviet Union is going to participate in the Olympics a lot, and this is going to be a really big. Is the United States or the Soviet Union going to be the better athletes? So it's going to be more of a friendly competition between them. Not, you know, friends in that they get along and go to dinners together, but problems are going to be solved more diplomatically as opposed to militarily. 
So we're going to start changing how we view military across the globe. We're actually going to see presidents and Brezhnev sit down and argue out how are we going to do with this whole nuclear weapon thing? Do we want countries around the world to have them? Is this something that should really just be reserved for us? And if it is, do we need to have controls over it? So we see a series of talks, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, eventually leading to the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, known as SALT. And we're going to see numerous ones of these treaties come out, and what they will do is start limiting again the nuclear impact and arsenal of countries around the world. First stop, SALT-1, no intercontinental ballistic missiles. So you can't have missiles that start in, say, Idaho and make it all the way over to Moscow. We had those. The Soviet Union never really had those, but we did. And also, we aren't going to make any more nuclear submarines. Submarines that can carry sometimes up to 100 nuclear missiles on them. Those need to be capped off where they are right now and really kind of control who has influence to do that for the rest of the time that we are in a nuclear age. So the world is happy about this. We are no longer going to be sitting there constantly afraid if we're going to die every 30 seconds. And eventually it starts becoming to the point where the Soviet Union and the United States are actually just going to go ahead and become allies in a very loose sense of the term. At the Helsinki Accords, we decide that the, the idea of brinkmanship, something we've talked about in class before, pushing as close as you can to the point of war and seeing who blinks were first is not going to be an acceptable option anymore. Detente is the way we want to go. It will be a peaceful competition. It will not be constant warfare. And this is going to be the new theme of the Cold War in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, really into the 80s. Except for one instance. And that is going to be a Soviet invasion of the country known as Afghanistan. Now, this is going to be a huge turning point because really it's kind of a, a blunder on both sides. Right around the time this is happening, uh, U.S. President Jimmy Carter and the Soviet premiers were meeting about how to manipulate these, the Soviet weapons arms even more, potentially eradicating the use of nuclear weapons on a global scale. Do they want to get rid of all of them together? And then the Soviet Union, in need of some resources that they want in Afghanistan and to just expand their borders, invades the country. And the United States becomes so livid at this that we walk out, done will not have a conversation with the Soviet Union or China about nuclear weapons anymore. And this is going to be a huge point. We almost take a huge step backwards here. It's almost to the point where, you know, screw detente. We're going to go back to this whole, like, if you do anything, we're going to war thing. And the United States will actually go out of their way to help the Mujahideen, which are going to be holy warriors in Afghanistan. Uh, the largest group of this Mujahideen is actually a group known as the Taliban. We're going to have millions of dollars in weapons too. Which, if you know anything about your recent modern history, giving weapons to the Taliban probably wasn't a good idea. So, we have this huge situation. Are we going to help these guys? Yeah, we are. And you know who is totally a part of this group? guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. Because, yeah... We totally gave him weapons, and we actually allowed him to get a top-of-the-line education in Oxford in England. So, we really do take a step back in Afghanistan. The whole idea of detente really is just, for whatever reason, we just we, we balk on our desire to really calm down this Cold War. And then last thing we talk about in the 1980s when it comes to really the Cold War is actually going to be a new president, Ronald Reagan, who's going to come into control. And when he does so, he believes that he the best case scenario for the United States is to outproduce the Soviet Union, make the Soviet Union quit and give up. So he's going to introduce an idea called the Strategic Defense Initiative. And the Strategic Defense Initiative, and this is going to sound kind of crazy, but it really is what it is, was a space-based missile defense system where we were going to have a bunch of satellites in space that could blow up any missiles launched by the Soviet Union with lasers and acid guns from space satellites. And we were going to have planes, like fighter jets, that could go into space and blow stuff up too. And we spent billions upon billions upon billions of dollars for this and it is a total disaster from the actual mindset that it works it like it totally doesn't work and because of this 
the Soviet Union becomes so afraid that they will actually spend themselves into bankruptcy. And this is where we get to this last phase of the Cold War, and that's the end of the Cold War. We will see a new leader in the Soviet Union named Mikhail Gorbachev, and his goal is to try to fix the Soviet Union because Reagan has effectively bankrupted it, and it's full of just rampant alcoholism, unemployment, economic disease. Like It's a, it's a bad scenario. So he's going to institute a few policies hoping to fix this. First, it's going to be Glasnost trying to reinstitute the faith in the government itself, open it up to the people again. And this is going to be an opportunity for the Soviet people to really express their opinions. And at first, it doesn't really go well. And in fact, it just doesn't go well in general, because the next step is going to be something known as perestroika. And this is supposed to be a restructuring of the economy, and it doesn't work. It's supposed to be kind of like that introduction of small-scale capitalism, something like Lenin did after World War I and the revolution. But it really never takes hold in the Soviet Union uh, for a variety of reasons, largely due to corruption that existed at the time. And then we actually introduced democratization. So they're actually going to allow the Soviet people to have a sort of a vote as to what goes on. So they're going to be given a group of potential candidates, uh, all members of the Communist Party, and then the people were able to choose from those. And it's a little bit better than, you know, just being told who your ruler is, but, you know, it's still not true democracy in its most uh, perfect sense. But this is a change in the Soviet Union. We are no longer going to be constantly at the end of things. Even Reagan himself is going to meet with Gorbachev numerous times. And during this time period, we're going to officially end the arms race between the two, largely because Gorbachev no realizes the Soviet Union can't win this. They cannot keep investing money in the military and expect this country to survive. And this is going to be viewed around the world as a great thing. But within the Soviet Union, we have some unrest taking place. Uh, countries are now viewing the Soviet Union on its way to the end, and they're like, hey, this is an opportunity for us to break away, particularly in countries that are not of uh, Russian influence, places like Lithuania and the Baltic region, who are actually going to try to break away in 1990. Well, Gorbachev will try to control that, and he does stomp down the actual rebellion, and Lithuania will stay part of the Soviet Union for a while, but what ends up happening is the weakness is there, and people are viewing it as a symptom of Gorbachev. They're viewing it as a symptom of just communism as a whole is falling apart. And the Soviet Union itself is toast. These little Soviet socialist republics are all falling apart. Uh, we are not going to see this combined effort again by the Soviet powers. We're actually going to see an elected Russian president, still technically part of the Soviet Union. But this guy's name is Boris Yeltsin. And Boris wants really nothing to do with communism. He is an extraordinarily progressive politician in Russia, and between Gorbachev and Yeltsin, the old members of the Communist Party, people known as the Politburo, are really going to just lash out against them, and we call this the August Coup. And the August Coup is going to be attempt by the members of this Politburo to overthrow the government, get rid of Gorbachev, get rid of Yeltsin, and reinstill like really hardcore communism back in the Soviet Union. But it fails, because the people don't want it. They thought the people were going to rally behind communism, and they were so wrong. It was not what they wanted. And the story begins to unravel in the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall falls down. Uh, the Latvian public, Latvia, Estonia, and the other republics in Eastern Europe break away in 1991. The Soviet Union is gone. Gorbachev resigns. And we have a new Boris Yeltsin-led Russia. In an attempt to fix Russia, he's going to institute something called shock therapy, which is supposed to be this dramatic shift from communism to capitalism. Throw all communism out the door and immediately shifts to capitalism. And in doing so, this will make us a modern economy. Had some unintended consequences. Massive inflation, uh, unemployment, and a huge political crisis that will come in. And this will actually set the stage for the rise of a new leader in Russia, one that we are very familiar with today. And you can see in this picture right now, he is right in front of Yeltsin. Yeltsin sees what's coming. It's time for the Putinator. Vladimir Putin will become the new leader in Russia. And really, since about the mid-1990s, he's been in control. Whether he's been president or not, it has really just been the story of Vladimir Putin. He is kind of dictating how things will go from here on out. And it is with that frightening realization that the Soviet Union officially dies and we are done with our videos for the year. Thanks and have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.